Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hello and welcome again to Celebrating Act 2. Um, you will remember our guest today from an interview that we did with him last year. His name is Stephen R. Campbell, the brain whisperer. And uh, today, this successful author and lecturer is going to share the details of the new brain science that can help transform your life and negative thinking, improve focus and clarity, and generally make you happier. Pretty good stuff. Well, welcome, Steve. Uh, welcome Hello. back to Celebrating Act Two. Thank you so much for having me. This is going to be so much fun. So we're, we're uh, at the beginning now of a four-part series mm -hmm. about how to better uh, utilize uh, the way you think of things. Uh, so tell us uh, what we can expect to learn and where we're going with this. Well, when I began teaching this in colleges years and years ago, students would say to me, why wasn't this taught years ago? And I said, we didn't know this years ago. This is relatively new stuff. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is the fact that our brain believes everything we tell it. And we're going to use that one thing to replace the many destructive messages that we give ourselves. And so by the time we're done with these four first presentations, we'll be able to actually think differently about ourselves, about our life, about what's going on. So this is going to be a very, very exciting series that I'm going to go through with you. So, wow. So we're going to do four parts as a, an introduction, explanation of how this works. Yes. And then what happens in video, the videos subsequent to these After four that, parts? we're going to be taking that information, which everyone will have, and apply it to areas of our life that just bother us. It could be losing weight. It could be smoking. It could be drugs. It could be anger. It could mm -hmm. be a tremendous bad feeling about yourself, insecurity, which can be devastating. It can be depression. All of these things can be addressed, but we really need the foundation, which is what we'll be talking about first in these first four. And after yeah. that, I'll teach you how to address smoking and anger and, and losing weight right. and all that. So, so, I can't wait. so I can't, I can't wait to get started. So what, what is part one? Part one is how we learn. So let's, let's begin with this. This is really interesting. While I'm talking to you, you are talking to yourself thousands of times faster. And your brain believes everything you tell it. Ooh, that's scary. And that's wonderful. The scary part is when we say, this is really hard. I cannot make this change. The brain says, oh, Okay, yeah, you're right. And then it makes sure you don't. That's the scary part. But here's the wonderful part. When you say, I can do this, this is a challenge, this is something new, but I can adapt and make it even better, the brain says, oh, okay, you're absolutely right. And then it becomes obsessed with helping you make it better. You decide. Now, the next question that comes up is, well, what if you're saying is not true? This is so exciting. Did you know that our brain never asked that question? The brain doesn't <laughs> care whether it's true or not. doesn't care. All it cares about is what you tell. People say, how do you know that? There's, this has been, I've been studying psychology for years and years. I think one of the best books I've ever read is Phantoms in the Brain by Dr. V.S. Ramachandran out of UC San Diego, phantoms refer to phantom limbs that have been amputated. And a patient will go into the doctor's office, he'll say, oh, you gotta help me, I can't do a thing with my arm. The doctor may say, well, that could be because I cut off that arm six months ago. And the patient will say, well, you didn't tell my brain that. My brain still thinks it's there. I can feel the right arm just as well I can feel the left. So the brain doesn't care whether what you're saying is true or not. but the psychologist we're going to hone in on today is Dr. Albert Ellis, who wrote a little book called A Guide to Rational Living back in 1962. That book turned psychology on its ear because what he suggested 
and has since been uh, developed and, and studied all over the world is this. Ready? And I'll say it really slowly so you don't miss it. Everything that we can do today is primarily based on what we say to ourselves about ourselves today. Now, notice I'm emphasizing the word today. When he suggested this, psychology said, no, 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 no. The way you are today is based on how you were raised. Unresolved childhood conflicts, that was Freudianism. That was followed by behaviorism, Dr. B.F. Skinner, who said, no, no, no. The way you are today is based on cause and effect. Another group said it's all in your genes. Another group said it's all in the environment. And Dr. Ellis said, you know what? I think they're all correct. How could they be correct? Because when you say it, and then lock onto it, which we'll also talk about a lot. Your brain's job is to make it correct. So let me give you a personal story that, that illustrates this. For the first 42 years of my life, I was really dumb in math because that's what I said to myself. I said, I'm really dumb in math. I can't do numbers. And guess what? The brain said, oh, okay, yeah, you really are. And I was. But I discovered computers in the 70s. And I began tinkering around, and I discovered that I'm really good with that stuff. So I got a graduate degree in computer science, and I began teaching computer classes at various universities. At this one particular university, the dean came to my office one day. He said, one of our math professors just quit. So you are our new math professor. <clears throat> um, wait a minute. I, 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 I can't do numbers. He said, do you want a job? Learn. There is the book next semester. Well, I needed the job, so I ran down to the Roner Park Library of all places. I picked up everything I could on brain-based learning and how the brain learned. That's how this whole thing started. And I based my curriculum based on how the brain learns, which I'll share with you in a second. And students began saying, oh my gosh, Mr. Campbell, you're such a great math teacher. And here's what I began doing. Rather than listening to what I've been saying to myself for 42 years, I began listening to those students. And I began saying, wait a minute. Math is really fun. I can do this. It's just a puzzle that you can somehow take apart and put it back together and discover things through algebra and calculus and all this stuff. And I got so, so I loved it so much, I ended up writing two college textbooks. And what do you think? Computer software and math. Was it magical? No. Here's the one I'm going to share with your people. Ready? Hold on to your seat. If everything we can do today is primarily based on what we say to ourselves about ourselves today, we can change what we are saying to ourselves about ourselves when? Right now. And what will your brain say? Oh, okay. Is it true? Don't care. All I care about is what you tell me. So here's one I want to share with your people. The primary element that holds all of us back from learning and growing and changing is what we say to ourselves. Did you hear me? Say it again. The primary element that holds us back is not how we were raised. It's not the mistakes that we have made, the successes that we've had, what we look like. It's what we say about how we were raised and what we say about our mistakes and our successes because the brain accepts everything. And what you can do is replace some of the negative stuff that you've been saying. Stephen, I have a question for you. Today. Yes. Um, it, this is phenomenal information because it seems so simple, um, but it is so profound. Yeah. But my question is, how often do you have to tell your brain the, the stuff you want it to know? If I tell myself today, you know, gee, I'm really good at math. Yeah. Um, do I have to say that 10 times a day? No. Do I have to say it every day? No, not really. It's, it's a matter of when, you, when you're confronted with it, you have a choice. I'm really good at this or I'm really bad at this. 
what your listeners are going to learn how to do is to catch the negative stuff that they're giving to themselves. And that's why when they say, all right, I'm no longer going to accept this. This negative stuff is going to be replaced by positive stuff. So it's when you catch yourself thinking destructive stuff about yourself. When unfortunately, according to Chad Helmstetter, author of what we say when we talk to ourselves, most of our stuff that we say to ourselves is negative. And I'm going to help your people replace that. Notice I didn't say change. I said replace. Why, why that, Steve? Because the brain hates change. The brain doesn't want you to change. But the brain loves to create new things. So I'm going to teach you in the next series or in the next session how to replace some of the stuff that you've been saying to yourself. Okay? Yeah. Now, here's another principle that I want to make sure we get. People behave and act not according to the truth. But the truth is they perceive it to be. So let me share with you a wonderful story of Cliff Young. Cliff Young, back in 1983, entered the first Australian marathon, which went from Sydney to Melbourne, 885 kilometers, 545 miles. 150 of the top runners in the world, professional marathon racers, flew to Australia to run this race. And Cliff Young showed up in galoshes and muck boots. <laughs> And the reporters clanged up and they said, gosh, what are you doing here? Doing? He said, well, I've spent my life on, the, on my outback on my 2,000 acre farm, chasing my 2,000 head of sheep. I mean, this is a five day race. I've run sheep for three. So we entered the race. And of course, with this kind of story, what do you think happened? He beat him. Of course, what would the, be the point of the story that he beat him? But listen to this. He beat every single professional racer by a day and a half. Oh my goodness. How did he do that? Well, when you run a race like this, you run for 18 hours and you sleep for six. Cliff didn't know that. Cliff didn't know you were supposed to sleep. So while all the other races were sleeping, he just kept on running. Now, that's really inspirational. I'm not here today to inspire you. Why, Steve? Because you know and I know that inspiration lasts for maybe three days. And then we go back to our old ways. I'm here today to help you change the way you think. Because it all starts there. Whenever I go past the Golden Gate Bridge, I'm amazed at what I see. But the Golden Gate Bridge did not start with a set of plans. It started in someone's mind. In this case, it was Robert Horton, who was a reviewer, who was a editor for the San Francisco Gazette. It started in his mind, and the rest is history. Now, let's go to another principle. Number one, the brain believes what you tell it. Number two, ready? Here we go. Your brain locks on to what you deem as important. The story I love to tell is when I was a little boy, my, my dad took me out and uh, uh, to teach me how to ride a bicycle. And he took me out to this field, took the training was off. He said, now, Steve, before I give you a little shove, you see that rock out there about 50 feet? Yes, Daddy. Don't run into that rock. And I got down on the bike. I was locked onto the rock so I would not run into it. You already know what happened. Bam, <laughs> right into the rock. That's the way your brain works. Your brain locks onto what you deem as important. So let me share with you a story that illustrates that. I ended up teaching math at the University of San Francisco. Susie came to the office one day. She was one of my students. After the first day of class, first day of the semester, sat down very shy. She said, Mr. Campbell, I'm really glad you're my professor because I am a C student in math. I said, what do you mean, Sue? She said, I have never gotten above the senior math test. I'm a C student. 
And I said, well, Susie, believe it or not, I used to be the same way. So let me work with her. So I worked with her. She got an A in the first midterm. And I gave her the test. And she absolutely freaked out. She went, <gasps> and then she said, oh, Mr. Campbell, this is a mistake. I said, what do you mean, Susie? She said, I have never gotten above when you see a math test. You must have made a mistake. And I said, I didn't, Sue. This is a genuine A. So then she looked at it longer. I'll never forget this. She looked at it longer, and her face just lit up. And she said, do you know what this means? And, of course, now I'm getting excited. So I sit down next to her. I say, I want you to tell me, Sue. Of course I do, but you tell me. What does this mean? This means that when I flunk the next test, I can still maintain my C. <laughs> I said, Sue, just get an A in every test. She said, oh, I can't. Why? Because I am a C student. And that's exactly what happened. She flunked the next test. She got a C in the course. So I sat down with her with the A, and I said, Sue, answer me this. What would have happened if you would flunk this first test? Do you know what she said without a moment's hesitation? She said, easy. I would have said like crazy to get A on the next test. I have to maintain my C. I said, Sue, just get A in every test. She said, oh, I can't. Why? Because I'm a C student. I've always been this way. This is the way I was raised. This is where I get stuck. This is what I cannot do. This is how I think. This is how I feel. This is where I cannot go. Or, or, or. Do you know when your old life ended? One second ago. So, when did your new life begin? One second ago. Then do the math. 60 seconds per minute, 60 minutes per hour, 24 hours per day. In one 24-hour period, you have 86,400 new opportunities for a new life every single day. All you have to do is take them. Now, if I stopped here and said, thank you so much, this is wonderful, you would say, I listened to this guy, he's really good, talked about the brain, what did he say? I don't really know, but it's really good. The reason is because if you don't apply this, you're going to lose it. If you don't use it, you're going to lose it. So what I want to do for the last couple of minutes, and then we'll close, is to share with you two new ways that will apply when you do something really well, and the other one will apply when you blow it, and that pretty much covers everything. Okay, so let's go to the first. This is what I call new ways of thinking. A study came out in 1975 called The Effort Effect at Stanford University. What they discovered is that most of us pass over our successes too quickly, too lightly for them to ever become a part of what we do. So when someone says, good job, we often say, oh, not really. It could have been better. I was part of a team. That's egotistical. I don't think so. It was all right, but not really. No, 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 no. Okay, what have we learned today? We've learned that the brain believes you. So when you say no, 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 the brain's going to say what? Oh, okay, you're right. And that compliments falls to the floor, which is not only sad, but what a waste. So here's your new way of thinking. When you do something really well and someone says good job, you look at them and you smile. And you say, thanks, I know. I can almost hear you laughing. When <laughs> I was down in Los Angeles, I shared this with about 300 Kaiser physicians at an all-day seminar. And when I said, thanks, and no, the whole barroom just broke up and howled. But they loved me. They loved me. They bought my book, my audio. When I was driving back to LAX, I was so excited, I almost drove out the freeway. So I stopped for Chevron or I stopped at Chevron, got a tuna sandwich and Coke. And when I was alone, nobody saw me do this. I looked in the passenger mirror of my car and I said, oh, you are the most amazing speaker. <laughs> and what did my brain say? You really are. But it also said, don't miss this. It also said, and Steve, ready? Don't miss this. You could even be better. It opened up the gate 
And I began thinking of all sorts of ways I could be a better speaker. I'll do this and that. Now, if I had said, you know what, you messed up here, you messed up there, which I did, what would have to the gate? Slam shot. So here's your new way of thinking when you do something well. From now on, when you do something well, you know what? Thanks. That makes me feel really good. And then you wallow in your success like a pig in slop. <laughs> wallow it okay okay now best for last what about the mistakes what about when you really blow it what about when you say oh my gosh how could I have been so stupid the sad thing about that question is when you ask that question your brain immediately pops up and says oh I know remember that dumb thing you did yesterday and that dumb thing you did a week ago, a month ago, a year ago. Remember how you're the slowest reader in the third grade? And what we do is we get out this list. And we start going down the list of all the dumb things we've ever done. Now, this is really important to understand. When we do that, your brain doesn't know that those memories happened a week ago, a month ago, a year ago. The brain's recording them again, but this time as if they happen when? Right now. And then you're carrying that stuff around. So here's my wonderful news. You don't have to do that anymore. Starting when? Right now. What do you do instead? Number one, throw away the list. Number two, use three wonderful words. You know what the words are? The next time. When you say the next time, you're saying three things. Number one, you're saying there is a next time. How many next times do we get? As many as we want. Number two, when you say the next time, you're saying, I'm still learning, I'm still growing, I'm still changing, which means I'm still making mistakes. But just because I failed doesn't mean I'm a failure. And number three, when you say the next time, what you're really saying is, I will never, ever, ever give up. I was on my way to work in the morning. I was waiting for the light to change. A kid came up to me in a very fancy car. I had my little Toyota. I looked at him. He looked at me. I knew what was going to happen. The light changed. He went peeling out from me, roaring up the freeway, passing everyone in his new shiny car. As I watched this, I had an epiphany. How many cars are already in front of him? Millions. How many cars are behind him? Millions. So maybe it's not a matter of how fast you get there. Maybe it's a matter of you're going in the right direction. But even when we go in the right direction, sometimes we just run out of gas. Sometimes we get a flat tire. Sometimes we even lose our way. But you know what? You can buy some more gas. You can replace the tire. You can get a map. And what's so wonderful about the brain, as we learn today, is the brain just says, oh, okay. Is it true? Don't care. All I care about is what you tell me. You say it, I believe it. You lock on to it, you know what I will do. I will do everything I can to make it true in your life. Wow. More after this. <laughs> oh. Wow, well, I was David, right. I, I want to correct you. You made a mistake. Okay. <laughs> Earlier, you said, I'm not inspirational. And oh. the answer is, yes, you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. <laughs> I appreciate That's that. terrific. Thank you. So, Stephen, you kind of discovered this on your own. You put it's together so a lot of how it happened. Um, I wanted to be a physician. I wanted to be a doctor. And when I was a junior in college, a young man in drugs on drugs ran into me with his old 88. I had a VW bug. And the guy that I was driving home was killed instantly. And I was in the hospital for a year uh, because everything was crushed, my legs, my face, the whole thing. And there was a point where they had to put me in a spike of body cast. And I'd already been in the hospital for three months in traction. So they had to immobilize because both legs had been broken. And um, so there I was laying on the bed on the spike of body cast. Look at the ceiling. That's all you can do. And I asked, how long will I be in this? They probably said another four months. And that's when I said to myself, 
I cannot do this. I'm helpless. And then I realize that's not true. I can replace what I'm saying about myself. I can't make my bones grow faster. I can't bring Dwayne back, but I can change what I'm thinking. So as I lay there looking at the ceiling, I said, okay, what am I going to believe? I'm going to believe that something wonderful will come out of this. What? I have no idea. When? I don't know. But that's what I'm locking on to. A year later, I was back in school on crutches, finished my degree, got my degree, and then I became a professional singer. Traveled all over America. It was on that tour I met my wife. <laughs> is one year in a hospital worth 50 years with Mary? Surprised you even had to ask. So it started then. I saw that, that we may seem helpless, but we're not. We can change what we think. And then I began studying like crazy psychology. And, and then I began teaching it in my courses. In fact, I taught it in a course called Career Transitions. And the president noticed that when students took my class in the first part of their program, they wouldn't drop out. So they made this, everyone takes Mr. Campbell's career transitions course at the beginning of the program. And during the years when I taught it, the retention went up to about 93%, which is outlandishly high. Yeah. And uh, so I saw this working over and over and over. Then 2008 happened. I got laid off, came home, was devastated. I was 62, beginning of the Great Recession. Mary came home, walked up the stairs, sat opposite for me. What happened? I told her. She said, you know what, Steve? Same thing. Something wonderful is going to come out of this. Just like the Spike of Body Cast. Something wonderful is going to come out of this. A few months later, I went to the senior center in Santa Rosa and said, I have this. Would like to teach it? They said, absolutely. So I taught it for free. Then all the other senior centers said, can you do it? Absolutely for free. And then there's Castle. There's this castle in the Santa Rosa Hills. It's a castle. It's where billionaires retire. I'd never heard of it, but they called me. We heard about you. Would like to come up and see our facility? I said, sure. So I drove up there, was blown away. They have their own lake, their own tennis courts, their own five-star chef, their own garden, everything. And they said, we'd like for you to do it here, your presentation. I said, wonderful. She said, what do you charge? Charge? Yeah, what's your fee? I've never charged anything. Well, shouldn't you have a fee? Oh, Okay, so I gave them a fee and said, sure, we'll pay that. <laughs> and then I went home and told Mary, and then people began saying, where's your book, where's your book, where's your book? What book? Don't you have a book? Well, I got two college textbooks on, on software. And, no, 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 no. You have to write this book, and you have to make it just the way you teach it. Well, because I've been teaching it for decades, it was all in my head. I'm a really fast typist, so it took a second out on our mortgage. This is way before pub computer publishing that you could do it and we ordered um uh 2000 books and they arrived um uh, on a saturday no they arrived on a week i had been doing this whole thing for free for a group called tops taking off pounds sensibly there are there are older people who want to lose weight so i've been doing it for free at the rona park senior center and the guy said you should come to our convention so i got some information they have a convention every single year at, at san ramon there are global wide group actually and i talked to the person told her about me she said we'd love to have you do a, a breakout session i said fine so um the month came up and it was actually this is april of 2009 the books came mary and i piled some books into our car drove to san ramon and i walked in to find out where the breakout session was so i could put my little stuff there and she said you know what steve we heard about you we want you to be the keynote speaker in front of 600 people very oh, nice. okay. I can do that because I used to do stuff like that. So I got up. We piled some books on a table. Mary sat next to it and just began knitting because we weren't sure if we would sell anything. So I began speaking. And Mary said, as soon as I began speaking, people began lining to get out of the room, which she thought was really weird until she realized they were running to the book table to buy a book because they were saying it's going to be sold out before he's done. So I'm on a book now. So they began handing $20 bills to her. Wow. And she, there was no place to put it. She had to put it in her purse, in her bra, the whole thing. I mean, and then when I was done, I got surrounded by people and we were selling thousands. 
And by the way, Steve, and I never expected this. Steve, where can uh, people uh, get that book today? From Amazon.com, Making Your Mind Magnificent. Okay. And, and Steve, it's you, on Kindle. You, you actually have an online course as well, am yes. I correct? Yes, it's an online course. I have been doing this for many years, and I would go down to Silicon Valley once a month and do an online course. And my daughter, who is a computer guru, said, Daddy, we have to get you filmed. So she came down one day and got a professional audio person that had me film. So my all day seminar is now online available with a workbook. And also when you sign up, you have a lifetime relationship with me because then I help people create affirmations, change affirmations, replace affirmations. And I do it all over the phone. So and, you not only get the seminar. And uh, where, where can people find that uh, at your people website? Can find it at Stephen R. Campbell dot teachable.com Stephen R. Campbell dot teachable.com and uh, so uh, uh, quite frankly this is a four part session and if we don't end now we're not going to be able to have a part <laughs> two three and four yeah. so uh, I want to thank you just an amazing amount because people of a certain age uh, grew up with uh, some of us did because I was in sales for a long time, uh, 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 of uh, the power of uh, positive, positive thinking. thinking. Right. And another another guy I ran across was just every day in every way, I'm getting better and better. Getting better and better. Right. Okay. Emil Kuei. So uh, this really resonates with me. And uh, right. But, but the, nobody's ever actually told the story and the whys as uh, succinctly as you have. So thank yeah. you. And I invite our audience not only to visit your website and to get your book, uh, but uh, to tune in again in uh, just a week or two when we have uh, chapter two, uh, part two of this amazing uh, uh, power that we all have to uh, uh, cha change, if you will, the way we see life and then have it's the life change for us. So thank you. Well, Good, Steve. You, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. I appreciate it. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.